It is therefore evident to everyone that Parmenides proposes to himself to deliver in reality the dialectic method, and that with this view he cursorily assumes it in a similar manner. In each of the things which have a real being, as in sameness, difference, similitude, dissimilitude, motion, and permanency, etc. Exhorting at the same time those who desire to discover the nature of each of these in an orderly method to this exercise, as to a great contest. He likewise asserts that it was by no means an easy undertaking to him who was so much advanced in years, assimilates himself to the Ibisean horse, and presents us with every argument to prove that this method is a serious undertaking, and not a contest consisting in mere words. How, therefore, is it possible that we can refer to empty arguments those conceptions about which the great Parmenides, evincing that they require much serious discussion, compose this discourse? How, likewise, is it reasonable to suppose that an aged man would busy himself with mere verbal contests and that he who loved to speculate the truth of things would bestow so much study on this method. He who considered everything else as having no real existence, and who ascended to the high watchtower of being itself. Indeed, he who admits this must suppose that Parmenides is satirized by Plato in this dialogue by thus representing him drawn down to juvenile contests from the most intellectual visions of the soul. <coughs> but if you are willing... No, no. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> Not long enough. <laughs> Did anyone by chance bring a copy of Parmenides? Uh, yeah. Oh, one hundred. Sure. At the beginning of this, who got the point that he's talking about? So that everyone is aware of the point that he's making in the text. Mm -hmm. Parmenides replied, You assign, O Socrates, a mighty labor to a man so old as myself. Well, you then, O Zeno, discuss something for us. And then Pythodorus related that Zeno, laughing, said, We must request Parmenides, O Socrates, to engage in this undertaking. For as he says, it is no trifling matter, or do you not see the prodigious labor of such a discussion? If, therefore many were present, it would not be proper to make such a request, for it is unbecoming, especially for an old man, to discourse about things of this kind before many witnesses. For the many are ignorant that without this discursive progression and wandering through all things, it is impossible by acquiring the truth to obtain the possession of intellect. I, therefore, O Parmenides, in conjunction with Socrates, beg that you would undertake a discussion which I have not heard for a long time. But Zeno, having made this request, Antiphon said that Pythodorus related that he also, and Aristotle, and the rest who were present, entreated Parmenides to exhibit that which he spoke of, and not to deny their request. That then, Parmenides said, it is necessary to comply with your entreaties, though I should seem to myself to meet with the fate of the Ibisean horse, to whom as a courser and advanced in years when about to contend in the chariot races and fearing through experience for the event, Ibicus, comparing himself, said, Thus also 
I that am old am compelled to return to the subjects of my love. In like manner, I appear to myself to dread vehemently the present undertaking. When I call to mind the manner in which it is requisite to swim over such and so great a sea of discourse, but yet it is necessary to comply, especially as it is the request of Zeno, for we are one and the same. Whence then shall we begin, and what shall we first of all suppose? Sure, keep going. Keep going. <clears throat> Are you willing, since it seems we must play a very serious game, that I should begin from myself and my own hypothesis, supposing concerning the one itself, whether the one is or whether it is not, what ought to be the consequence? That's the task of the communist. Mm -hmm. No, keep on. Oh. Uh, that Zeno said, by all means. Who then, said Parmenides, will answer to me? Will the youngest among you do that? For the labor will be very little for him to answer what he thinks. And his answer will at the same time afford me a time for breathing in this arduous investigation. That when that then Aristotle said, I am prepared to attend you, O Parmenides, for you may call upon me as being the youngest. Ask me, therefore, as one who will answer you. I, there's another sentence I can't refer I thought it came later. This is the uh, this is Parmenides' view of the dialectic. That Socrates then said. What method of exercise is this, O Parmenides? And that Parmenides replied, It is that which you have heard Zeno employ. But, beside this, while you were speaking with Zeno, I admired you, your asserting that you not only suffered yourself to contemplate the wandering which subsists about the objects of sight, but likewise that which takes place in such things as are especially apprehended by reason and which someone may consider as having a real subsistence. For it appears to me, said Socrates, that after this manner it may without difficulty be proved that there are both similars and dissimilars, or anything else which it is the province of beings to suffer. That Parmenides replied, You speak well, but it is necessary that beside this you should not only consider if each of the things disposed is what will be the consequences from the hypothesis, but likewise what will result from supposing that it is not, if you wish to be more exercised in this affair. How do you mean, said Socrates? As if, said Parmenides, you should wish to exercise yourself in this hypothesis of Zeno if there are many things. What ought to happen both to the many with reference to themselves and to the one, and to the one with respect to itself and to the many? And again, if many are not, to consider what will happen both to the one and to the many, as well to themselves as to each other. And again, if he should suppose if similitude is, or if it is not, what will happen from each hypothesis, both to the things supposed, and to the others, and to themselves, and to each other. And the same method of proceeding must take place concerning the dissimilar motion, and permanency, generation, and corruption, being, and non-being, and in one word, concerning everything which is supposed either to be or not to be, 
or influenced in any manner by any other passion. It is necessary to consider the consequences both to itself and to each individual of other things which you may select for this purpose and towards many and towards all things in a similar manner. And again, how other things are related to themselves and to another which you establish, whether you consider that which is the subject of your hypothesis as having a subsistence or as not subsisting. If being perfectly exercised, you des design through proper media to perceive the truth. That's the dialect of the Right. And Proclus mentions that in the chapter 9, that six lines down. <coughs> six, seven, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the, the one that bothers me is the last sentence. Indeed, he who admits this must suppose that Parmenides is satirized by Plato in his dialogue. Mm -hmm. Do you see the assumption? He's arguing against people who think it's a logical exercise. Merely a logical. Merely, yeah, a, logical. merely a verbal contest. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Does that straighten it out? Does the subsistence have being? Mm -hmm. You have to be there before you can determine the truth. But if you are willing, let us consider in addition to the above what Parmenides promises and on what subject engaging to speak he entered on this discussion. Was it not then about being according to his doctrine and the unity of all beings to which extending himself his design was concealed from the vulgar while he exhorts us to collect the multitude of beings into one undivided union. If therefore this is the one being or that which is the highest and which is perfectly established above the reasons conversant with opinion, is it not absurd to confound dogmas about intelligibles with doxastic arguments? For indeed, such a form of discourse is not adapted to the hypothesis about true beings, nor does the intellection of unapparent and separate causes harmonize with dialectic exercises. But these differ from each other. So far as intellect is established above opinion, as Timaeus informs us, and not Timaeus only, but likewise the daimonic Dimoniaco Aristotle, who, discoursing on a power of this kind, exhorts us, exhorts us to make our investigations neither about things perfectly unapparent to us, nor about such as are more known.
lot. You guys are being very nice to Ken this evening. Mm-hmm. <coughs> I'm going to start reading from now on. Yeah. Perfectly obvious then. Okay. Well, I don't know if I know well, enough to ask the question. Yeah. yeah. But how do you get a yeah, right. Good question. Good. How about four and D from there on? What about it? Four and D, such a form of discourse, that is the dialectic, Mm -hmm. is not adapted to the hypothesis about true being? Uh, I think uh, it just, why couldn't it be doxastic argument? What does that word mean? Doxastic arguments. Reasonable or what? Yeah, arguments on the level of doxa or opinion. See, he had said, is it not absurd to confound dogmas about intelligibles with doxastic arguments? For indeed, such a form of discourse seems to me that would go back to doxastic arguments. What's the difference about dogmas and dogmas? Dogmas. Yeah, it's it's very it's the same uh, Greek word, but but dogmas about intelligibles that's a whole lot different than dogmas. Uh, Art dogmas. Yeah, yeah. teachings about a teaching. Yeah, yeah, but the important word there is intelligibles. Mm-hmm. More modern. Mm-hmm. That's the modern. Yeah. Oh. The word itself just means teaching. Well, in the dictionary here, it says doxology. Or doxology. Oh. I know, but he's talking about doxastic, what that means. And it says usually a short thing of praise to God. I don't know if that's related to this stuff that no. It's from the Greek uh, word for opinion. This is from the Greek. And but that's the religious aspect about hymns and praise. Uh, because religious people when they uh, make hymns, they make them about things they believe. So we could say that doxastic is synonymous with opinionated? Or you can call that... On the level of opinion, not rising above it to demonstration. You have intellect and dialectic, and opinion and doxastic. He has reasons conversant with opinion. Uh-huh. Oh, I see. What I did was I didn't connect the two sentences. Yeah. That sentence goes back to that. Yeah, right. yeah. As far as intellect is established by opinion. It is far, therefore, from being the case that Parmenides, who places the science of beings above that which appears to be true, to those who makes, who ranks 
sense before intellect. Uh, should in, that that Parmenides, who places the science of beings above that which appears to be truth to those who rank sense from it before intellect, should introduce doxastic knowledge to an intellective nature. Such a knowledge of this kind is dubious, various, and unstable. Or that he should speculate true being with this doxastic wisdom and inane discussion. For a various form of knowledge does not harmonize with that which is simple, nor the multiform with the uniform, nor the doctastic with the intelligible. What is the science of beings? Doxastic knowledge is dubious, various, unstable, inane. Above that, which appears to be truth to those who went to the Lord and That's a tricky one. Can I assume that the being, even though it's not capitalized, is synonymous with intellect or supreme up there? <coughs> yeah, it should be a complicated. All right, then, huh? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to hold up the show? No? Mm -hmm. Well, the word in game is what I looked at. Empty your face. Right. <laughs> and also unsubstantial. From the Latin name. Unsubstantial, too. So it doesn't, it looks to be the most substantial because it's sense, uh, involved with the senses, but it's believed. Mm -hmm. In any discussion. No, not this one. Okay. 
good? Um, but later, Mark will <coughs> review this. Oh, uh, yeah. But still further, nor must this be admitted that such a mode of discourse is perfectly foreign from the discussion of Parmenides. For he discusses about all beings and delivers the orders of wholes their progressions beginning from the one and their conversions ending in the one. But the argumentative method is very remote from scientific theory. Does it not therefore appear that Plato must have attributed to discordant hypothesis, a discordant hypothesis to Parmenides, if it be said that he merely regards an exercise through opposite arguments, and that for the sake of the power employed in this exercise, he excites the whole of this evolution of reason. Indeed, it will be found that in all the other dialogues, Plato attributes hypothesis to each of the philosophers adapted to their peculiar tenets. Thus, to Timaeus, he assigns the doctrine about nature to Socrates, that of a republic, to the Elean guest, that about being, and to the priestess, the Athema, that respecting love. Afterward, each of the other dialogues confines itself to those arguments which are adapted to the writings of the principal person of the dialogue. But Parmenides alone will appear to us wise in his poem and in his diligent investigation of true being. But in the platonic scene, he will be the leader of a juvenile muse. This opinion, therefore, accuses... Muse. Muse. Okay. This opinion... Referring to them? You know, the play <laughs> That's if you take to be merely... If, you, if it's a merely a logical theory. exercise. A merely logical exercise, then you're saying... Oh, all uh, right. Uh, uh. This opinion, therefore, accuses Plato of dissimilitude of imitation. Though he himself condemns the poets for ascribing to the sons of the gods a love of money and a life subject to the dominion of the passions, how, therefore, can we refer a discussion of doxastic and empty arguments to the leader of the truth of being? How could you never yeah. assume such a thing? How? Oh, yeah. Never. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, Progress, that I ever brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that guy could put you down. <laughs> We're going to get to it, of course, but uh, the major principle of growth was in Plato in this way is that the proper objects of opinion are not the same object of the intelligible. Mm -hmm. uh, something about the nature of being. If, if you approach on the side of opinion, or don't say, it's mm -hmm. foolish. It, it, uh, it doesn't deal with that kind of object. Like we say, but if it be necessary that omitting a multitude of arguments, we should make Plato himself a witness of the proposed discussion, 
We will cite, if you please, what is written in the Theodius and the Prophet. For from these dialogues, what we assert will be apparent. In the Theodius, then, Socrates, being excited by a young man to a computation of those who assert that being is immovable, attacks among these an opinion of this kind entertained by Clementes, and at the same time assigns the cause I watch it at least, for Parmenides, who is one of these more than for all the rest, for I, when very young, was conversant with him when he was very elderly, and he appeared to me to possess a certain profundity perfectly generous. I am afraid, therefore, lest we do not understand what has been asserted, and much more am I fearful that we fall short of the meaning of Parmenides. With great propriety, therefore, do we assert that the proposed discussion does not regard a logical exercise, and make this the end of the whole, but that it pertains to the science of the first principles of things. For how could Socrates, using a power of this kind and neglecting the knowledge of things, testify that the discourse of Parmenides possessed a depth perfectly generous? And what venerableness can there be in adopting a method which proceeds doxastically through <laughs> opposite reasoning? and in undertaking such an invention of argument. Yes, shall be charged. Mm. Press on. All right. Again, in the sophist, exciting the Elaine guest to the perspicuous evolution of the things proposed by him, and evincing that he was now accustomed to more profound discourses, inform me, says he, whether it is your custom to give a prolix discussion of a subject which you are able to demonstrate by anyone, to anyone by interrogation. I mean such discussions as Parmenides himself formally used, accompanied with all beautiful reasons. And of which I was an auditor when I was very young and he was very elderly. What reason then can be assigned why we should not believe Socrates when he asserts that the arguments of Parmenides were all beautiful and possessed a generous profundity and why we should degrade the discussion of Parmenides, hurl it from essence and being and transfer it to a vulgar, trifling, and empty context. Neither considering that discourses of this kind are alone adapted to you, nor regarding the hypothesis of being characterized by the one, nor anything else which opposes such an opinion. <coughs>
it suggests that a discussion is, is or has or is essence and being. Like if uh, degrading the discussion of parmenides hurls it away from essence and being, then to not degrade it, the discussion would allow the discussion to remain in essence and being. So it attributes essence to being to dialectic or whatever you want to call it. along with beauty, all beautiful, profound. I likewise think it is proper that the authors of this hypothesis should consider the power of dialectic such as is exhibited by Socrates in the Republic how as he says it surrounds all disciplines like a defensive enclosure and elevates those that use it to the good itself and the first unity purifies the eye of the soul, establishes it in true being, and the one principle of all things, and ends at last in that which is no longer hypothetical. For if the power of this dialectic is so great, and the end of this path so mighty, it is not proper to con confound doxastic arguments with a method of this <laughs> he was sure you get that. all of that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's his argument. For the former regards the opinions of men, but the latter is called garrulity by the vulgar. And the one is perfectly destitute of disciplinative science, but the other is the defensive enclosure of such science, and the passage to it is through these. Again, the doxastic method of reasoning has for its end the apparent, but the dialectic method endeavors to arrive at the one itself, always employing for this purpose steps of ascent and at last beautifully end in the nature of the good. Is this dialectic method the same as Hegel? No. <laughs> well, what is it in the That's ancient sense? Process. What is the dialect? Hegel is toxic. Yeah, Hegel is nearly toxic. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hegel said you took the one art opposing ideas and you. Yeah, uh, Hegel also thought that Parmenides was only half of uh, Heraclitus, and if you really want to get to the truth of things, you have to see her fight us from becoming. <laughs> Coming back to what I was asking, Hegel believed that you took opposing arguments and you found truth in each of them and you arrived at a synthesis. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between Hegel's view of dialectical understanding or argument and this view? There's no catharsis in And, uh, what this, that remember here he had talked about using opposite arguments? Yes. Uh, this kind of dialogue, dialectic that you're talking about relates more to what Aristotle writes about in his book about dialectic. Uh, and that's where the word, uh, I guess, caught on afterwards. The idea that uh, uh, it's a logical method for arguing different points. Uh, but uh, uh, platonic dialectic is, uh, is not that. Um, and uh, the whole book seven of the Republic builds up to a vision of the art of dialectic. Okay, could you give me a gist of what that means, please? 
so I have some understanding of what we're reading. Uh, I think we went at the beginning. Didn't he give a fairly good definition of Parmenides' dialectic? That would be helpful. Where? <laughs> I mean, we should have the beginning of this. Yeah, what we've been reading tonight. What we're talking about. We 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 assume we took a hypothesis as to that something was, and what were the conclusions about it on itself, on it on other things. There were four relationships, weren't they? If it wasn't, or if it was. And then you see what are the implications for those things. Is it, is it, is not. It is and is not, and yeah, on itself, on others. And the consequences of it. Yeah. And then he goes through, when Parmenides goes through this, this dialogue, he, that's what he follows in every one of them. Every it's a of discovery. Yeah. So, I mean, it, and it comes out that, mm-hmm. it, you know, that it's just obvious, it's not logical, that certain things just can't be there. And is that uh, based on observation, or is that based on reasoning? Or is that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, Hegel is is based on. It's not so much seeing the truth in each one as seeing that the emptiness of each one. Uh, that neither side, neither the thesis nor the antithesis, is alone is the truth. Uh, it sounds but like a vote. <laughs> <laughs> Majority or Well, I don't know. I, I had the impression that, it, that there were fundamental truths in each argument, and the two of them kind of joined together to form one new thing. Each mm. time we had that every decade, you would have a whole new generation Opposing the past generation and then yeah. resulting in some new the, development uh, in society. No, uh, rather than that there was an emptiness in the last one and there's an emptiness in the future, what would you have for the future? For and instance, you, come to anything new? you could have a model. He says that the Buddhists talked about nothingness, emptiness. And he said, now that, that aspect of it, we're talking about the Western thought, which and has he said, to do And in, in contrast to that, Parmenides is talking about being. I realize that. But and that this being is equally empty as the uh, Buddhist emptiness. And therefore, the unity of being and nothingness in becoming is what he sees as the synthesis. But he doesn't say that being is some reality. That isn't what I read here. I read that being is synonymous with intellect. And that's that's the term You're back I'm in here now. I'm reading them here. Yeah. The whole thing I'm is not reading about Buddhists. Don't I'm not just talking about Hegel. I'm not talking about yeah. Hegel, I'm talking about what does this ancient dialectical okay. method mean? Okay, so we'll scrap anything you've ever heard about Hegel as having yeah, anything okay, to do with dialectic. Okay. 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 That's and not, throw out Marx too. Erase that. Now come to what we're talking about now so that it has a meaning for yeah. the day. It has to do with uh, dialogue, question and answer. Okay. Uh, the method was that one would ask a question and one would answer. Uh, and through this method, they were to explore things on the level of uh, um, ideas, such as uh, same and other, similar, dissimilar, motion, rest, one and many. They were to explore these by method of question and answer rather than by a method of giving a short speech or a long speech. So in other words, Socrates used the dialectical method to obtain new learning? Is that what you're saying? Not... No. Yes? (laughs) That's what I'm trying to understand. Not knowledge. Yeah. New knowledge, right. As long as you use the word knowledge with a capital K. Okay. 
then I can understand what small k now means. Mm -hmm. Take the last three lines on that paragraph. Yeah. <coughs> dialectical method endeavors to arrive at the one itself. Always applying to the purpose steps of ascent. And at last beautifully ends in the nature of the good. So there's a, a method. You know what it's trying to reach. You know what it uses for its purposes of ascent and its end, which is another nature of the good. You ask for an example of that method. It essentially, ask you say, hey, can you run me through a couple of steps so I can see what the example would be? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I know the answer. Yeah. <coughs> Oh no! Try the this do. Yeah. <laughs> Try the one. If the one is not, what is the effect on the others? <laughs> <laughs> the one is the highest turn. It's going to be above. It's going to be above the gods. Above God. It's the, it's the ultimate turn point to be that it is possible to understand it without at the same time participating in some degree in it. I can understand that through the banquet or the symposium that birth and begetting is a form of divinity where you are <coughs> touching on immortality and in having birth and begetting with another individual, whether it's human children or whether it's ideas, it is something that carries on the person themselves in the, in the form of immortality. And that in itself it touches on the divine. Okay. Or am I wrong? No, no, no. We're now going above that. Above that. Right. Do you agree in the, in the symposium? Beauty could be described as a one. Mm -hmm. But one is different than beauty, isn't it? Because <coughs> a lot of things are one that are not beautiful. And therefore there's a difference between those two terms. So we're talking about the idea of one would be higher than an idea of beauty. Look. They're at least different. Mm -hmm. All right? So if you wanted to just explore what the nature of the one is in itself, you would need to explore just what it is. Mm -hmm. Agree? Yeah. If there, if there were such a thing, is it likely that it would be a whole? Yeah. Oh, we're talking about the one in the pure sense, aren't we? Yeah. And the possibility now is that it could be regarded as a whole. I don't think so. Well, then you agree a whole has parts. Yeah. A parts one or many? Could be multiple. Yeah. In that case, parts would indicate a plurality, would it not? Yes. How many? But we said the one is going to be a pure one, did we not? That's right. Well, then could it have parts? We want a pure one. We don't want a one that's a many now, do we? No. Oh. Oh. That it couldn't have parts. Oh. Can't have parts. A part, of course, would be a part of a whole, wouldn't it? If there is a part, it has to be yeah, a part of a whole. Yeah, it would be a part of a whole. So, in other words, the one and the whole would not be synonymous. Would. Yeah, pardon? A one and a whole would not necessarily be synonymous. Yeah. A one well, then, not there is part. such a thing as a one, then it would neither be a whole nor a part, so. No. It would be 
an entity of its own. Yeah, but if we find in the one any parts, we'll certainly say it's not our kind of one, would we? Because they're not going to do that. Yeah. If we found a one that had a top and a bottom and a middle, that's we'll not say, one. that's not a one. No. Or a beginning or a middle or an end? No. Or a left or a right or a north or a south? No. Or size of any kind? Now, before we get to size, mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. measure, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Say, so if it didn't have any of those aspects, you think that it might be able to be, to, to be framed in terms of straight lines or circles or combinations of them? I don't know. I don't Drawn, sketched, diagrammed, mm -hmm. or what? No. Well, any figure is either composed of straight lines or curves. Do you agree? Yeah. And a straight line must always have a beginning and an end, mm -hmm. and some point between them, and they would be, relatively speaking, its parts. Any curve now, or any curvilinear line at all, would not be a function of some circle sweeping an arc from some point of origin. <coughs> Then it must have it is made up of some kind of circle or curvilinear line. It'd have to have parts, wouldn't it? Since it'd have to be a center, it'd have to be a circumference, a radii, put it on. Either part or whole. That's true. And if it were an irregular figure, it would be simply a combination of straight lines and curved lines or curvilinear lines. And they would be parts, would it not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if it were circumscribed in some way, we'd have an inside and an outside, and they would be of the respective parts, wouldn't it? Mm. Well, then, could it, could it have any form then? It would have to have a form then. Pardon? It would have to have a form. If it had a form, then it would have a shape. Yeah. If it had a shape, then it would be circumscribed by either straight lines or curvilinear lines, or some combination of them. Mm -hmm. But if it had straight lines, remember what we said about that? It would have parts, would it not? And then it cannot be composed of curvilinear lines with straight lines, but they would be parts of it, wouldn't it? And if it had a curvilinear line, they would be a function of circles, would they not? Circles composed of radii, centers of circle, arcs sweeping out, would it not? Wouldn't they be its respective parts? Mm -hmm. But we said that our one wouldn't have part. Then could it have any shape? It can't have any shape. Like that? Yeah. <laughs> it would have to be a more. Well, it has to be amorphous. We, but if you agree, it either has boundaries or it doesn't have boundaries. It would have boundaries. If it have boundaries, we're back to the same point where we're yeah. I don't know what it would be. Oh. <laughs> but we're still pursuing the idea of whether it's a one. If it is a one, if you're a one, we could say this much about it, you know? What would you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly not many. Yeah, well, the slightest <laughs> hint of manyness, we'd have to drop it, wouldn't we? Because we're after a pure one. Mm -hmm. What we're exploring is we're adapting Plato's parameters between us. <coughs> Okay? Yeah, that's what it's right? No. No, there's no part that we did that wasn't simple. Yeah, but I mean, the final conclusion about a one is... Very simple. It's simple? No. <laughs> Should be. You know, it's a simple thing there is. Simple, simple <laughs> pure one. It better be simple, or <laughs> or it's got parts. <laughs> we have parts, <laughs> and we have found many distinctions. <laughs> if we can sum together, <laughs> and therefore say it has multiple parts. <laughs> By no means, therefore, is it fit that we should draw down to Doc's <laughs> arguments a method which is established among the most accurate sciences. 
For the merely logical method, which presides over the demonstrative fantasy, is of a secondary nature and is alone pleased with contentious discussion. But our dialectic, for the most part, employs division and analysis as primary sciences and as imitating the progressions of beings from the one and their conversion to it again. But it likewise sometimes uses definitions and demonstrations, and prior to these, the definitive method and the dividing method prior to this. On the contrary, the doxastic method is deprived of the incontrovertible reasonings of demonstration. Is it not therefore necessary that these powers must be separated from each other and that the discussion of Parmenides which employs our dialectic must be free from the empty variety of mere argument and must fabricate its reasoning with a view to being itself and not to that which is apparent? And thus much may suffice an answer to those who reprobate our hypothesis. For if all this cannot convince them, we shall in vain endeavor to pers persuade them and urge them to the speculation of the truth. The whole uh, ninth section has been a question whether we should consider the Parmenides uh, as a logical exercise. And this he calls a drawing down uh, to, to draw this ex draw what's done down to the level of the logical exercise. What was done? In the, in the Parmenides dialogue, there's a long uh, dialogue of the type which you began in between Parmenides and Aristotle. Now the question is whether this uh, is a logical exercise or more. Proclus is arguing that given the fact that he's making use of this method of dialectic, it's absurd to consider it merely a logical exercise. And to consider it merely a logical exercise is what he calls drawing it down to doxastic argument. Mm. Okay. Actually, the question you asked previously about dialectic, it, uh, see, he's calling this our dialectic, and uh, that means to me that there may be some other, he wants to distinguish this from anything else which might be called dialectic, but which is merely toxastic argument. Uh, Because mm -hmm. dialectic has had many uses over the years. Aristotle had one uh, book about it, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with what Parmenides is doing. Mm -hmm. And when he refers to, to the, our dialectic, for the most part, employs divisions and analyses of primary sciences, and is imitating the progression of being from the one, mm -hmm. and their conversion to it again, what does he mm -hmm. mean by that? Uh, the progression uh, 
a being from the one. From the one. From what the potential. Starting with the one as the, the source. This is his thesis about the Parmenides, which shall unfold here. Yeah. Oh, because that's just the preview of the coming. Yeah, the menu. He will unfold that whole thing. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe one of the prompts. I'm, maybe I'm jumping again. It just doesn't sound clear to me what you're saying. It's the highest. It's the highest reality can be of the highest. Uh, I use the word reality. This is the one. The highest reality we call the one, because all beings aspire to what they regard as good. Whatever they see as a good, they aspire to it. Do they not? Right. Well. The more a person can identify the nature of the good that they aspire to and the clearer it is in their mind, then the more likely they will be able to both understand it and grasp it. Did you go along with that? I agree. Uh, therefore, the greatest understanding of the good that mankind can perceive will have to have a certain content, will it not? A certain description. Yes. Yeah. Interesting enough, the highest content described by the highest good comes out to be the idea of the one, a pure idea of the one. So take that as step number one. Therefore, the idea of the, the one is also the idea of the good. That's why they're often linked, or they're used alternately to mean the same thing. This being so perfect, there is in, in various languages of describing this, there's an overflowing. Being perfect, it overflows. Uh, there's a metaphor that they often use to describe it. Now, curiously enough, I've separated it as an overflowing. But it's really, I, at the moment, it overflows, it returns. In that return, at that moment of return, it must therefore come to recognize its source. That is to say, there's a moment of seeing, pure seeing. Since it recognizes its source in that, that is the definition of that. That is to say, of, of intelligibility. That pure seeing sees its source. That's also another way of describing a pure being. The capital B. Since it's an active, vital kind of thing, right? it's not a dead process, it's not a logical process, it's an activity, it's a pure activity, therefore we can say it has a vitality to it. Right? Uh, this, this in its turn, right, which now reaches its own goal, it too now overflows and turns upon itself, repeating, as it were, its origin or its parent. And as it turns, the, uh, the thing that we have just described, let me just put one more word to it, this is, as it were, a unity, a shadow of the one. That unity now, we're going to call this uh, being intelligence or being intelligence vitality. That, that unity, as it were, it now perceives in a similar way as the one did, overflowing and turning upon itself. It too has a moment very similar to what happened 
with one overflowing you're turning into itself. This also turns around and turns to itself. And in that respect, these three now in a similar way as this was a shadow of the one in unity, this becomes a shadow of the next level of, of being. That is to say, there's then uh, intelligence, there's existence, like being, and then like vitality, there's life. That is to say, there is a rational element because it had directed itself and found itself to its own source. There's a rational element there. It had a form of existence and it had a form of life. This, therefore, is now going to be called soul. So if you stand here, but our dialectic, for the most part, employs division analysis as primary science and as imitating the progression of beings from the one. It's going to imitate this process. It's the progression from the one. All right, now I'm cutting it in half, each of these in half, or at that midpoint. That's the progression from it, and it's returned to it. And so he's going to have a dialectic that's going to mirror this. And, and that's what they mean by in their conversion. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So his dialectic is going to mirror his metaphysics. That's metaphysics. His dialectic is going to mirror his metaphysics and provide him with a principle of growth for his own being. Therefore, his dialectic mirrors his metaphysics for his, for the evolution of his soul, of his psyche. In doing this, it sometimes it uses definitions and demonstrations. And prior to these, the uh, definitive method and dividing uh, method prior to this. I said, hey, don't confuse this with just mere opinion. Because to the degree that it does this, it corroborates it each time it's able to do that. It doesn't verify it, it corroborates it. That's the profundity in itself. Well, all all of uh, all good metaphysics, or all profound metaphysics, there's always a relationship with the metaphysics and the psychology. To the degree that there is that kind of connection, to that degree it's uh, interconnection. But he's going a step further. He's saying, hey, there's a rational, pure reason, a pure dialectic that can mirror this. He's got one additional element which is unique from this profoundly oh. long oh. here. And that is between intelligence being and the one, he has another term. And that's this whole thesis here, it's the he name. Which sure. will develop through this whole book. Yeah, that's right. But that I think we'll get to that. But and I think you'll see that that, middle, that new term is just a a fine way of understanding this metaphysics. No, it's actually distinct. It's, it's about being and intelligence in his speaker. Well, you'll have a chance to say that. I see. No, see. I hope to develop it. the next chapter. Well, please read it. All right. All right, we'll get there. Yeah. All right. But just to show, I mean, just to help you with that, right? Uh, this three part, it may be separate. Yeah. It may be separate, but the principle behind Propolis really is that each each part mirrors the whole. Um, no, it's unique. The human has a unique. Well, he each has, part he has contains soul, within soul, itself the whole. Intelligence is the one in one. Um, it's a distinct thing for him that a lot of mm -hmm. authors recognize. Well, but, uh, um, 
Yeah, well, since we're not there yet, we're, we're going to be glad to get there very shortly. Yeah, we talked one line before and we're on this next session. Really. What? Come on, jump into it now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'll start from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, we got to read chapter 10. I'll let you just go there and then we'll start back at the beginning. Yeah. But whatever we do. I, I mean, this has got me interested, too. Yeah. yeah. It's hard for me to visualize how it fits into a model. Actually, you can see where he goes beyond Plotinus on the top of page 28. Uh, where he says, yeah. well, why don't you just do uh, chapter 10? Mm. Uh, yeah, let's. Like, Read up to that point. Yeah, just pick it up from chapter 10 and let's proceed. Don't go past that. Yeah. 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 Y
that others, if I may be allowed the expression, perfectly evince things more impossible than impossibilities. Which circumstance some prior to us perceiving, as it appears to me necessarily to happen in these hypotheses, have considered it as deserving discussion in their treatise on this dialogue. <laughs> With respect to the first hypothesis, therefore, almost all agree in asserting that Plato, through this, celebrates the superessential principle of whole as ineffable, unknown, and above all being. But all do not explain the hypotheses posterior to this uh, after the same manner. For the ancient Platonists and those who participated in the philosophy of Plotinus assert that the intellectual nature presents itself to view in this hypothesis subsisting from the superessential principle of things, and endeavor to harmonize to the one and all perfect power of intellect such conclusions as are the result of this hypothesis. But that leader of ours to the truth about the gods and co-favorator of Plato, then I may use the language of Homer, who transferred within, well, excuse me, transferred what was indefinite in the theory of the more ancient philosophers to them and reduce the confu confusion of the different orders to an intellectual distinction in the writings which he communicated to his associates, this our leader, in his treatise on the present subject, calls upon us to adopt the distinct division on the conclusions. To transfer this division to the divine orders and to harmonize the first and most simplest things exhibited to the first beings, but to adapt those in the middle rank to middle nature according to the order which they are allotted among beings, and such as are last and multiform to ultimate progression. For the nature of being is not one simple and indivisible, but is insensible. The mighty heaven is one, yet it comprehends in itself a multitude of bodies. And the monad connectedly contains multitude. But in the multitude, there is an order of progression. And of sensible, some are first, some middle, and some last. And prior to these, in souls, from one soul the multitude of souls subsist, and of these some are placed in the order near, but others more remote from their homes, and others again fill up the medium of the extremes. In like manner, it is doubtless necessary that among perfectly true beings, such genera as are uniform and occult should be established in the one and first part of the whole, but that others should proceed into all multitude and a whole number and that others should contain the bond of these in the middle situation. It is likewise by no means proper to harmonize the peculiarities of first, first nations with such as are second, nor of those that possess a subject order with such as are more <laughs> unical. But it is requisite that among these, some should have powers different from others, and that there should be an order in this progression of true beings, an unfolding of second from first natures. In short, being which subsists according to, or is characterized by the one, proceeds indeed from the unity prior to beings, but generates the whole divine genus, namely the intelligible, intellectual, supermundane, and that which proceeds as far as to the mundane orders. But our preceptor likewise asserts that each of the conclusions is indicative of the divine peculiarity. And though all the conclusions harmonize to all the progressions of the one being, or of being characterized by the one, yet I am of opinion, it is by no means wonderful, that some conclusions should be, should more accord with some hypotheses than with others. For such things as express the peculiarity of certain orders do not necessarily belong to all the gods such as belong to all, are doubtless by a much greater reason present with each. If, therefore, we ascribe to Plato an adventitious division of divine orders and do not clearly evince that in other dialogues he celebrates the progressions of the gods from on high to the extremity of things, sometimes in fables respecting the soul and at other times in theological modes, we shall certainly attribute to him such a division of being together with this of the progressions of the one. But if we can advance from the other dialogues that he, as will be manifest in the course of this work, has celebrated all the kingdoms of the gods in a certain respect, 
It is not impossible that in the most mystic of all his works he should deliver through the first hypotheses the exempt transcendency of the one with respect to all the genera of beings, to being itself, to a psychical essence, to form and to matter, but that he should make no mention of divine progression and their orderly separation. For if it is proper to contemplate last things only, why do we touch on first principles before other things? Or if we think fit to unfold a multitude of the proper hypothesis, why do we pass by the genus of the gods and the division which it contains? Or if we unfold the nature subsisting between the first and last of things, why do we leave unknown the whole order of those divine beings which subsist between the one and natures that are in any respect deified? For all these particulars convince that the whole discourse is effective with respect to the science of things divine. But still, well, for, well, 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 yeah. one paragraph at a time, but then that happens. Yeah. Okay, let's go back. Oh, yeah. Now, have we come to that part yet, Rod? No, no, but uh, you will uh, you'll see it very clearly on okay. like thousands one. of references as we go. Okay. In fact, we'll get there. How about the first paragraph, second? Let's go. The first two paragraphs. Those questions are pretty good back then. Huh? Okay. Question. <clears throat> Talking about a greater and more difficult content that now remains, having taken care of the logical exercise. Uh, uh, and is that contest with Plotinus or with other people or what? That's what Plotinus and the ancient Platonists. He, if I understand the thesis right, he sees that through the ancient Platonists and Plotinus is taking all the conclusions of the second hypothesis and not making a distinction of the hierarchy. He says quite the contrary. The second hypothesis is a progression and unfolds the gods. Um, the one being, which is the principle of it, he distinguishes the one out from being in that, and he wants to take the one as higher than being in the first hypothesis, and the second, excuse me, and he says the participation of the one in being and the being in one is different from that he generates a whole uh, model down to that. Um, so he is disagreeing. He's saying the conclusions unfold in a progression. Um, the old problem of the first three introductions to the second hypothesis is, he says, uh, are rationally explained in this thesis of his, but haven't been explained in the past. He says that the first hypothesis works in reverse, that the first thing after one is not many. In fact, you're proceeding from below to above, because when you get to the end of the first hypothesis, you eliminate who see it and being. He says you're working up to that, and then the second hypothesis jumps in on that level. It talks about the one and being. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a very uh, unique thesis, and... Uh, well, but I think the answer to your question is, is that it is against Plotinus and the ancient Plato. Mm -hmm. That he's making further distinctions within a Platonic tradition. He's not against them. That's right. Um, yeah. That, I don't see that he's saying that there is he's making further distinctions. Oh, no, he yeah. had many places. He, there's places where uh, he gives Plotinus the out on interpretations. He says, well, Plotinus saying this is incorrect, but if he did mean. Yeah, well, because yeah. where do you go from the one but to intelligence being? No, he says you go to uh, you go to Kenaz. He says it's not the property of one to produce anything but unity. So therefore, its first emanations are Kenaz or unity. Yeah, but aren't those intelligible? Well, or intelligence being? I mean, if you no, I think they're going to. I think. I mean, you would have it. to give it 
terms that would make it different than intelligence being then in some respect. I think you're going to see that it plays an interesting role above intelligence and being. It's really much more Then it's got to have some of the words to describe it, right? can't be intelligence being. Right, no, no. It's got to be something different. No, it can't be un one, it can't be the ineffable, and it can't be an intelligence being, so it has to be. It'll be a un un unipypal stasis. But isn't that what we learned intelligence being was? The um, unicorn hypostasis with the with the I Ching sign. No, it's it's going to be different. It, I think. See, it's it, I, I, it's not clear to me, and I'm working. It's something I've been working on through this guy. And the best candidate can for for it can be the one of the second hypothesis can be as he has, because he sees the well, one. That's what I thought it would Informing be. being yeah. in a different way that being participates in the one. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the highest part of being, the one of the second hypothesis? Yeah, but that's not being. No, sorry, by the way, uh, I, I think it's good to do this, but uh, uh, certain distinctions are going to be made that you haven't seen yet, though. Okay, sure. Rod is saying when you see them, you'll be able to see the points with these distinctions. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And you're, you're going through reflections and saying, but I haven't seen them yet. Mm -hmm. Is it not the case that those distinctions that I have already seen are adequate? Oh, okay. By the same way, well, it's only one of the distinctions you've seen. Proclus is going to be making one other, and that's going to restructure many things. The structure is going to remain, but within it you're going to see more distinctions. Oh, okay. Yeah, then he's going to put a hierarchy in intelligence being. Oh, okay. But in this discussion, Rod only has one alternative. He either has to unpack the enads or the idea of the gods and Proclus right now, to satisfy your question. Mm -hmm. And that would be jumping out of this section that we're in now. Yeah, that won't come up until... And that, that's not going to come up until... Book well. three. Yeah, that's more kind of stuff. We're going to go through the whole first hypothesis again in here. He does it himself in, in the arguments in very interesting ways. Yeah. Well, okay. that's fine. You know, I, it, I, I was trying to understand that there was some position or some that Rod was indicating that there was something that existed between intelligence being and the one of, of the first hypothesis. Yeah, you have it right here, as a matter of fact. It's right here. Yeah, but it's not, it's not the composite of being an intelligence. I didn't say it was. I said it's right well, here. Well, you say that the intelligence being is a shadow mm -hmm. of the one. I said unity is a shadow of the mm -hmm. shadow of the one is unity. And mm -hmm. is that descriptive of that which is in that circle there, which is intelligence being here? I'm sorry, he regards these as a unity. Uh, the idea of unity is separate. Mm. And Proclus will make that point. And that's the basis of the Hinaas. Mm. And it's also, by the way, goodness. Not only unity, but also good. Goodnesses. Yeah, goodness. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of goodness. So mm. let's, let's okay. look at sure. this. It's a matter of working out all of these The argument on page 28. <coughs> Seems to be. Wait, wait, before you go to 28. Oh, we're still on 28. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure, as yeah. best we can, not to have everyone's words. Okay. Here's, here's just a quite straight quote right here, in which the order of true being ends and indeed is spread out under the unities of the gods. You know, we'll find lots of statements like that. I don't know. I hope we get them. Yeah, that was one of his uh, statements at the beginning, wasn't he? He was going to unpack the, the gods, right? Yeah, but the being is below that. The <laughs> unity of the gods. But I think Plotinus is going to be harmonized in one way, but I, because I haven't heard, heard him in any way talk about the trace of the one and the intelligence. And I think that would be the best candidate for the he man. Yeah. Well, I, 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 you could, I think one could argue that even though Plotinus is in a Platonic tradition, Plotinus makes distinctions that Plato doesn't. I think we're going to find the same thing with Proclus. We're going to find oh, yeah. the same thing with Iamplicus. We can see the same thing with the Master. That they're in a tradition, they're purifying, they're seeing more in it. And this is just one more beautiful way of seeing the whole new set. But it's still going to be remained in this edifice. Yeah, it's not a whole big section added, you know, some new thing. It still fits within the whole frame. And that's why as we go through this, you know, what's going to be important to do is to make sure you keep it 
bring along your copy of Parmenides. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, if you quote verbatim the Parmenides in here in quotes, that's uh, in the section for a discourse on it. Um, Just to return back to the second, are we finished with the second paragraph or any points people want to make out of it so we can go on? Then I presume we can go to the third paragraph. Mm -hmm. That's super. So if you stay in that first sentence in the third paragraph. How did, what was this overflowing? I bet that it's overflowing of the one. Did he use it? Is that word unity right there? Yeah, unity prior to being. Yeah. Unity prior to being.
But well, I guess my question is, isn't that unity what they're talking about prior to being? Isn't that the being prior to being? You know, right here on down to bottom. I felt I always thought unity had, you know, was not simple one or the one itself. Yeah, this isn't. This is the one of the second. He understands it as a participatable one, but okay. first is an imparticipatable one. All right, that's the way I would look at it. Yeah. Yeah. What What's your point, though? Well, it says, in short, being which it sits according to or is characterized by the one proceeds indeed from the unity prior to being. I was wondering if, he would, if this unity that we're talking about here was the non-participating one. You mean the first one? Yeah. No, this is the second. The word unity. Yeah, this is the second one. I'm not sure I understand what's going on, though. Or, uh, are you asking a question in terms of the text? Yeah. Are you trying to get an answer that emerges from the text? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then are, are you seeing what Rod is seeing at this point? Or are you accepting what Rod said but don't find it in the text? Where are you in this respect? Uh, I don't find it. So I'm asking about if I if okay. I where are you exactly on the text? Uh, on this on the bottom of page twenty eight in okay. short. If that's uh, one on the trying, bottom of page twenty eight. That's right. What I'm trying to to divide in that sentence, I see three parts. There is as as Ron would call, I'm trying to understand in those terms, the unparticipating one. The, the beings after the participating one. I see it, three things there. Again, I'm trying to put them in order so that I can see them. And I came upon this word unity prior to beings. I'm saying to myself, is this the one of the first hypothesis? And Rod says, no. This is the one of the second I found. So, whether it is the first or the second, how does that help you understand that sentence? See, Mike, what's, what would you say is going on in that sentence? By the way, we skipped a whole paragraph. Oh, did we? That's all right. Yeah, no, no, is that what we were? No, that's okay. Mike, how, how would you structure that to see whatever dynamic is going on? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, okay. okay. That's why I say whether it's in the first or the second or the yeah, right, whatever okay. hypothesis, I don't know whether that helps. Right, okay. I'm just saying that to be able to speak about it, you know, as to how I see it in my mind. Oh. Okay. In short, being which subsists according to, or is characterized by the one. So I'm trying to put these in a hierarchical, in a hierarchy, and I say, being which subsists, their subsistence according to, or is characterized by the one. That's a group that that that's being some being there that proceeds indeed from the unity prior to being. Um, could you read this? Being characterized by the one.
Right. It's a one. Yeah. That's good. Go ahead. Okay. Proceeds indeed from the unity prior to being. Look. Okay. It's a derivative model? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Done. And that is logically prior to being. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But generates <coughs> the whole divine chain. Right. Intelligible. Intellectual, super mundane, mm -hmm. that which proceeds as far as to the mundane order. Well, how, right. how does that fit? How does this that part fit with the stuff that we built? Right. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to add more arrows. You need more arrows. Going down oh, you mean the then you're gonna we're gonna have to break up this being then, right? See, the but but generates. Yeah. What's that? It's prior to being, but mm -hmm. generates. Mm -hmm. So it's not. It's not that it doesn't generate, mm -hmm. even though it's prior to being. It generates the whole yeah. and uh, the whole divine genus, the intelligible intellectual. It's it's being that generates being, or it is. But generates the whole divine genius, right? Yeah, the whole hierarchy of of beings. And that is nothing other than, right? The whole divine genius is nothing other than intelligible, the intelligible, and intellectual, and super mundane. That which proceeds as far as to the mundane. And therefore there's further hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is just defining that class, that genus. Right. Mm -hmm. And therefore this generates in its turn, right? It proceeds as far as as the mundane, mundane. order. Mm -hmm. right? That's the same structure, that overflowing. Right. That same structure. Yeah, I, structure. Right. It's very well. I, I don't, you know, it's a, like I said, it's a further breakdown of previous yeah. ideas. But it's no. not different. Yeah. No, no, no. no. This is. This is the. That's no. And that's the first place you get the henas as uh -huh. a functioning entity, right there. But, well, up to this point, we had this, the structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is being, right. intelligence. Right. One, this is the overflowing, produces this, turns about itself. Right. This does likewise, turns right. about itself. Right. If that was one, you wouldn't have any. That's no unity. Where is that going to that fit? You? That's no. Now, how that how that is located, how it functions, what role it plays, is the subject of the book. Okay. Then that's no. Right. Another way he has of talking about unity 
and how it's different from being uh, there can be there can be a unity that is not being things that are potential that are not yet mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. oh yeah therefore it doesn't follow that just simply because being is one it doesn't follow that anything that is a one is a being Hmm. Like that. Hmm. Now, one of the interesting principles is is this one. Uh, it's this really great principle, isn't it? which we find all through Plato and all of these people. If there is a class, there are members in the class. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to say, look, this is not merely a logical merely logical arrangement. The members in some in some rather interesting and mysterious way derive their particular character that makes them members of that class. They derive from that some particular character. Therefore it's like a source class to its members. Once you have that then you can see where unity comes from. Yeah, I didn't get that. But well, all you need, all you need is a series of beings. Mm-hmm. Then that's a class. Therefore, oh. there must be a pure or true being. Right. Anytime you have it, yeah, right. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's that is it's by nature that. Yeah. All right. Then, to the degree that the predicates you assign to this, now we're going to have true being. Mm-hmm. We have true intellect. Yeah. Suppose, therefore, the only thing that you can say that makes them what they are is the fact that they have been the recipient of a particular kind of goodness and unity. Uh oh, new the class, new, yeah, mm-hmm. derivative class. So there's th- and then there has to be one that that yeah. they they're derived from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here, what do you mean by terms upon itself? Mm-hmm. Is that a recursive property? Yes, or yes that's a recursive that, property. In that theory, what yes. do you mean by yeah. that? Yeah. That's a very curious term he has here, Don, which will be fun to track out as intellect. He starts off with intelligible, a mean term, intelligible and intellectual, and his third term is intellectual. And he understands that as the whole and the part. Somehow that's recursive for him. That's where you stop a progression. I understand it, but tracking that term mm-hmm. will unpack that question in here. Intellect. Mm-hmm. That was a generic question about his previous. Oh, okay, so that was a very curious model that that is something that holds the problem. Huh. That's central, I think it's central to this whole tradition. Like a picture in that middle lecture in Boston. In the handwriting. Well, it's a the handwriting. <laughs> drawing it. Picture of itself drawing itself. Which one did you have here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're all mm-hmm. illusions, so I'm wondering about this. <laughs> Me too. Uh, The further down you proceed from being, like he says that vitality is intermediary, and vitality presupposes existence. In other words, for it to have vitality it must have existence. And further down, to be intellective, it must be vital, but it also must have uh, being. Somehow in the last term, which is intellectual, he has the whole in the part. And so it's recursive in some sense because you can go back to intelligence through that part because the, whole, the first term or intelligence is contained in it somehow. Mm-hmm. So even, even true being, even true being for him is intelligible.
I can tell we're not going to read as fast as we have been. Well, no, <laughs> it's a question of uh, <laughs> reading as, as, as fast as we can. But, uh, oh, but I, mean, I think it's going sure to slow down. So. <laughs> what, what's super mundane mean? Are you clear on what mundane means? Mundane, uh, you know, in modern terms means worldly or uh, common everyday. But I got it. This is super <laughs> mundane. Beyond. Beyond the what Monday. Oh. The line of phenomena. But then it ends the sentence. Yeah, these are the gods. And that which proceeds as far as right, the the Monday. <laughs> yeah, if you yeah. consider, well, if you consider, range. oh, from the, from the Monday. From the earthly to the heaven. Have you ever oh. landed in an airplane where you came down through the clouds and it was above, right above the clouds? And as you came down through the clouds, it was dark. That's the mundane below the clouds. And above the clouds is the super mundane. Oh, okay. I, I got that. But you're flying both areas. Right? You're flying both areas. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we uh, pick up from 10? And, uh, yeah. I thought we can go through... What, why do they make a distinction? <laughs> 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 they make a distinction between intelligible and intellectual. Yes. Hey, one, one word. Uh, we're kind of starting later and later yeah. each yeah. Friday night. Can we kind of get a little bit earlier to 10? Oh, oh, I tell you. Start at 10 o'clock? It's hard on me. Well, all right. 10.15. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, 10.15 to 12.15. <laughs> Are we have a Friday night next Friday? Sure. I don't know when you're Thursday. Yeah! I thought they were leaving. Uh, Wednesday. I hope so. Why not? Well, it can be held in someone's house. I don't think I'll be here either. Oh, oh okay. I have something to do. Anyone want to opt for one? I think it's a fine thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be gone. Yeah.